for eons untold, man has searched the sky for something to hunt. Taking to the waters around Carolina coastal marshlands in search of two things, really. The birds themselves, of course, plus the company of others who enjoy both the sport and the satisfaction of bagging that perfect duck on that perfect day. In the early part of the 20th century, it was common practice for wealthy Northeastern businessmen, accompanied occasionally by their ladies, to put aside their work and travel to an exotic locale, like our state's Outer Banks, where they could relax and commiserate with one another while embracing the bounty of their success. The destination they found was well worth the journey. The distant splendor of the waterfowl hunting grounds around Currituck Sound. The Outer Banks was so wealthy with birds that they were shot and transported back north by the boatload. Occasionally, one of these Northeastern businessmen became so smitten with the rich natural beauty of the banks that he decided to stay on. One such man was Edward Collings Knight Jr., lately of Newport, Rhode Island, by way of Philadelphia. Knight was a widower and had recently taken up with a younger spitfire of a French-Canadian widow woman, Marie-Louise LaBelle Bonnat, who proved to be his perfect match. And together, they proved a perfect match for a spit of land within sight of the famed Currituck Light. In 1922, the Knights began construction on a 21,000-square-foot, electrified, 15-bedroom, Art Nouveau-inspired residence they simply called Corolla Island after the nearby village that had arisen to serve the hunt trade. They named it Corolla Island for a couple of reasons. One, they didn't want people to think that they were building a hunt club. This was not a club. And the other reason was they literally created an island around the building. They brought the spoil up and built the land up a little bit so that the house wouldn't be right at sea level. They dredged the sound and uh, put in a couple of canals. They put in a boat basin so they could build the boat house. And believe it or not, they put in a 6,000 square foot basement, which was very unusual and still is today to have a basement on the Outer Banks. While digging around in the sand, workers discovered two near fossilized halves of a huge whale head, evidence of the many such creatures taken from the region during the 19th century. Thus, the name Whalehead Club. In some ways, the Knight's substantial home and hunting retreat was indeed an extravaganza, said to have cost $385,000 back then. It was steel framed and constructed on pilings pounded deep in the earth, and the walls were 18 inches thick. Certainly no hurricane or nor'easter was about to huff and puff and blow this house down. There are 18 dormers, each with a striking view of the Atlantic or the Sound, and five chimneys. The Knights also had the first elevator on the Outer Banks. It was used as a dumbwaiter. Guests of the Knights could place their baggage on the elevator and have it whisked up to their floor, where a servant would deliver it to their bedrooms. And there were four guest bedrooms known for their colors, the lilac, green, blue, and pink rooms all separate rooms, all with their own bathrooms, which was very unusual for this part of Currituck County. The Knights had uh, separate rooms, which uh, was not all that uncommon among the elite of that time. They had them because they could. Mrs. Knight believed in the medicinal powers of salt water, and so her bathroom did have hot and cold salt and fresh water. All of the third floor and half of the second was servants' quarters. It's easy to picture them climbing this narrow stairs to their room after a hard workday, meeting the needs of their sportsman guests and taking care of the house and property. The boathouse uh, served, of course, a, a very important role. Some of the local people that the Knights hired were hired as marsh guards or as guides. 
and so the guides would go to the boathouse early in the morning, perhaps uh, take the boat out and scope out where the, the birds are, are congregating, uh, deposit the decoys, and then come back and be prepared to take the knights and their guests to the many different blinds uh, on the Kerala Island property in the Sound. Knight had an eye and a passion for residential architecture. He chose an elegant Edwardian style for their new North Carolina residence, with hints of the French-Canadian homes that Marie-Louise had admired as a child. The combination proved to be simple and graceful. The home's long straight lines were softened by lovely Art Nouveau curves here and there, and enlivened by splashes of color. During the restoration, we were told that the exterior originally was painted yellow. We were all shocked by that. And we forget that Art Nouveau loved color. Marie-Louise loved Art Nouveau and couldn't imagine creating a home in any other style. Her home in Middletown, Rhode Island was filled with Art Nouveau architecture that she had purchased. And so they brought the Art Nouveau elements down here and literally built the house around the Art Nouveau. The dining room shows the care that went into designing and decorating the home. In the early 1900s, we know Mrs. Knight attended an Art Nouveau Expo in Paris, and Tiffany, Louis Comfort Tiffany, was there. And so we think that perhaps she literally purchased the room, the walls, the lighting, uh, everything but the furniture that exists here now. Dancing organic forms sweep across a doorway set off by Tiffany sconces on the wall. It's almost as if the decor itself seems to take flight. A view of the sound through the dining room's slender, Tiffany-inspired windows almost makes you believe that you're sailing on a ship. The striking Art Nouveau Steinway and Sons Grand Piano in the library is definitely a one-of-a-kind. The piano was purchased by Mrs. Knight. She actually called Steinway and said, I want a piano built but I want to create the design. I want it to have Art Nouveau elements. You can see the uh, beautiful carved lines, and it has untraditionally six legs. The library, of course, was the center of conviviality at Corolla Island. After being outside in the frigid Outer Banks wind, they would enjoy perhaps a glass of brandy and a, a roaring fire and a nice game of cards. In 1934, the Knights arrived in the fall, but left abruptly. We believe that Mr. Knight had taken ill. So they went back to their residence in uh, Rhode Island and never returned. After a succession of diverse owners and uses, the home that would forever be known locally as the Whalehead Club, with its 2,000 acres of sea oats and sand dunes, was left to the elements and began a long period of neglect. And finally, some 60 years later, somebody began to care. Uh, it was just in terrible shape. And Currituck County officials in 1992 had the foresight and the vision to purchase 39 acres of land and the very badly deteriorated Whalehead Club itself for the sake of preservation. A group of volunteers formed the Whalehead Preservation Trust in 1989 to oversee a multi-million dollar renovation of the house and property. Right now we are in the furnishing stage of restoration so that we can refurnish the house the way it was during the night era. When the light slants a certain way, perhaps glowing through the clouds of an evening storm building over the banks, it's not difficult to imagine Edward or Marie-Louise 
watching the gathering darkness from their dining room window, not knowing that their future together in their dream home would soon be cut short by his advancing age, not knowing that their house would live on. It would be good to be able to tell them that their beloved Corolla Island will continue to stand four square against the elements, as long as someone cares, even half as much as they did. Thank you.